has called us to bring us in our everything, to bring everything we are before him. So as we sing these words, will you bring not just the goodness, not just the things you're proud of, but the things you are ashamed of. As we sing these words, will you lay and pour out your deepest and darkest shame as well as your most glorious joy at the foot of his cross. Sing these words with me.
portion of our uh, musical theater camp. Uh, a lot of our students are here, but there are a few more uh, that, that, that you won't see this morning. We've been working for one week so far, and uh, they've learned almost every scene, every song, um, all of the lines, and uh, they've been doing a lot of diligent work. We were at Disney all day Friday, including a Disney workshop, uh, where they also learned even more stuff. So next, next week brings, uh, putting it all together, getting the sets done and props done and all the scenes completed and memorized. Uh, we look forward to performances. Uh, uh, this weekend it will be in Parrish and here and in Margo. So um, Chris will share a little bit more with you about uh, our event here on Saturday night. But uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the song. The song is called Sala Salute in Whoville. Sala Salu is a, a, like a heaven or an Eden, a place of perfection that they hope and dream to uh, go to and be a part of. And so we're going to be singing that. Uh, this is Brennan. He's normally the cat in hat, but today he is singing Horton's part because Horton cannot be here. So if you know the story, so uh, when he says his line, you'll be thinking, oh, this is Horton. So I'm going to let them take over. Hi. 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 <laughs> But the show itself is all Dr. Seuss stories, 
And so for me, it takes me back to being, being read Dr. Seuss. And for some of you, it may be nostalgic thinking about reading Dr. Seuss to your kids. Uh, it's a really fun, fun show. So I hope that you'll come. 6.30, admission is free, uh, but we will take a love offering uh, during the show. And so if, if you're not going, I mean, if you can't make it Saturday, then by all means go to another show. But if you can be here Saturday, let's pack our house out uh, for our students who have been working for the past two weeks. Saturday, 6.30, Susie will be there. And uh, as we've been uh, doing musical theater camp, and, and uh, the challenge has been for me, as someone who's kind of new to preaching every Sunday, uh, to come up with sermons and doing camp and doing all this. So I figured we'd start a good old sermon series this Sunday. Okay. You ready? Yeah. yeah. Sermon series. Of all you Mythbusters, I wanted to call it Stupid Things Christians Say. <laughs> and I, thought was, I thought that was a little unfair because most of the things on here are things that I've said. <laughs> but they, that's where they came from. They're things that I've said to somebody else and somebody else has gone, that's really stupid. <laughs> oh yeah, you're right. Now that I think about it. And so uh, so we call it Mythbusters because we don't want them to be eating green. Um, but just know that these are all things that I said. So if you said them, don't feel too bad because I've, I've been there. Uh, our first one that we wanted to start with is God wants you to be happy. This is a myth. Now at first glance it seems very true. It seems very real. Of course God wants me to be happy. God is good. Happy is good. God loves me. Why would he want me to be happy? But when I hope we will delve into the reality of Scripture and the reality of what God's gospel has to say for us, I think you'll find that that's not the whole truth. That's not, that's not nearly as deep as, and, and real as what God has in store for us. So in order to kind of unpack this God wants you to be happy, I figured we'd look at everyone's favorite book in the Bible, which is Job. <laughs> And if, you, if you've been around church long enough or read Job yourself, you know that Job is actually one of the most difficult pieces of scripture to accept. It's really easy to understand. It's very straightforward. And in fact, it's kind of fun to read if you're, uh, if you're into literature of that nature. But uh, it's, it's hard to accept because of what it says about God and what it says about people and what it says about the reality of life. And uh, I think it comes right in the face of this concept, that God wants us to be happy. So we're going to start with Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. And this is kind of the, the scene setting for the rest of the book. So this is starting at chapter or at verse 6. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, also the accuser, also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand now, and touch all that, is, that he has, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, all that he has is in your power. Only do not stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Satan follows through on what he says he's going to do. He destroys everything that Job has, and he even brings, uh, collapses a roof down upon Job's children. And Job is left with nothing. And in agony and in sorrow, he tears his cloak, and he puts himself in ashes, which is the Hebrew tradition of mourning. It's a deep, powerful sorrow. And Satan comes again before the Lord, and the dialogue is exactly the same way. Only this time, Satan says, it's because you haven't let me touch him. If you let me touch him, then he'll curse you to your face, and God allows it. And Job ends up with sores all over his body. 
And he's not only in emotional pain of loss and grieving, but he's now in physical pain, physically suffering. And he's mourning and crying out to God, where are you? What's going on? Why is this happening? Job deals a lot with uh, Job's faithfulness and, and enduring through suffering, but I think the overwhelming theme in Job is actually about control. While we've been doing musical theater camp, I have a dog named Jonah. He's a big, he's a mutt, but he's, he looks like a big lab, and he's kind of mixed with greyhound. He's, he's a weird looking dog. He's big. And uh, despite how big he is, the, the days are long as we do musical theater camp, and so I've asked my mom, uh, to come and uh, help me out for the week. And so she agreed to come and help me take care of Jonah. Now the thing is, I'm an only child. I don't have any children of my own. Jonah is the closest thing to a grandson that my mom has. <laughs> and she treats him that way. She spoils the dickens out of his dog. And uh, when I'm at home alone, and it's just me and Jonah, uh, he follows me around. He's a pack animal. And so he likes to be with the pack leader. He doesn't like to be alone, and he can avoid it. So when I'm in my office, I'll be you know, sitting at the computer, and he'll curl himself up right beneath my chair. And then I'll get up, and I'll go into the living room, and he'll get up and follow me. And I'll sit on the couch and watch TV, and he'll either get on the ottoman or curl up underneath my feet. And he likes to be with me. And then I'll, I'll stand up, and, and I'll get hungry, and maybe go to the kitchen and start to cook. And he'll follow me in the kitchen, and he'll curl up, curl up right next to the stove on the rug. Because he knows that's where I'm going to spend most of my time. He wants to be right there next to me. And I noticed that when I came home, after about a week of my mom taking care of Jonah, I noticed that my mom was kind of moving around the house and, and Jonah and all that, that he wasn't following her. I'm like, huh. So as I observed, I noticed that uh, my mom would, and Jonah would be on the couch and maybe they'd be watching TV or something. And Jonah would get up and he'd go to the sliding glass door. And my mom would get up and open the door for him and line it up. And he would do a part of the thing and use the bathroom and all that. And he'd come back in and uh, when, he, he, when he went back in, he would come to the door and he would bark. And my mom would go over and open the door and let him in. And then he would maybe go uh, to the pantry and put his nose up in the pantry and he would kind of whine a little bit. And my mom would get up and go get treats and she'd give him a treat. He'd say, oh, you want a treat? Oh, what do you want? You want to go and she'd give him stuff. And then, uh, and then Jonah would uh, eventually get up and go to the front door and he'd see people out there and he would, he would do one of these. He'd be at the door like this. My mom would get up and go and put the leash on him and take him outside. And uh, I asked my mom about this. I said, do you, do you realize you're following your daughter around the house? <laughs> and she said, yeah, I know. Isn't it great? I trained him to tell me what he wants. <laughs> and I said, who trained who? <laughs> and we do this a lot. We, we trick ourselves into thinking that we're the ones in control when really we're not the ones in control at all. We trick ourselves into thinking we have control over the circumstances of our lives, that no matter what comes along, we can fix it, we can make it better, we can be safe, we can be comfortable. And my friend, is that, that is a delusion. The reality of life is that we have very little control. The only thing we really have influence over is our small sphere of the things we touch and think and, and, and can, can move around. But the idea of control is an illusion. There's only one who is in control. There's only one who reigns over all of creation. And God, in God's good wisdom, knows this and teaches this through Scripture. And so Job finds himself in the midst of serious loss, circumstances that are far beyond his control, circumstances that God has allowed to happen to him. And in the midst of his crying out, in the midst of his mourning and, and calling out to God, saying, I don't understand this, Lord, Job's friends come along. And they come along with a, a pretty reasonable explanation. They say to Job, Job, don't you know that God is just? Don't you know that God is good? If you sin, he punishes the wicked. And if you are good, he lifts up the righteous. Clearly, you are suffering because you've done something wrong. What you need to do is go, to go to God 
and present yourself in confession over whatever you have done wrong. And if you do this, if you confess, confess your sins and you make yourself right before God, then God will restore what's been taken and he will lift you back up again. And at first glance, doesn't that seem very reasonable? Seems like a decent way to think about God, to, to, to focus our theology. But Job knows better. The problem with, with that whole brand of theology, Job points out, is that plenty of bad things happen to good people. And plenty of good things happen to bad people. The way you're describing God isn't true. That's not the way God works. God isn't somehow in our control. That if we do this, then God must do that. If we act good, then God must make us happy. If we act obediently, then God must make us comfortable and safe. And if we act poorly, then God must punish the wicked. If someone does something wrong against us, then God must come down and, and strike them down and declare vengeance on them. I've had a, a recent struggle with my homeowners association. <laughs> I, uh, I've got some neighbors uh, who have also, along with me, gotten letters about like, patches in the grass and a tree hanging over a fence. And, now keep in mind, we're neighbors. It's his tree hanging over my fence. And I'm going, I don't, I don't care. It's a nice tree. I like it. It looks pretty. It, it makes my yard better. But they have literally sent him and me letters and I can't tell you, I mean, I, I really, I probably thought this out, but I put a picture of my yard on the screen, because it's really nice. My mom is helping me out, we've done some planted some trees, I mean, it's a nice yard. I don't know what they're complaining about. But they have sure enough sent us letters and even find us. And both of us have sat there and been angry about it. And we want God to come and strike it down! <laughs> you know what's going to happen? I'm going to pay the fine. I'm going to put seeds in my yard and hope the grass grows. <laughs> it's going to happen. I don't have any influence. I don't have much power over these other people. They've got me, they've got me by the bylaws.
And God's job is not to make us happy. There was a commercial uh, for Lending Tree that was out a couple years ago. And it's got this, uh, this guy who's, you know, a nice upper middle class <coughs> guy. He's got polo and khakis and, you know, he's having a good time. And he says to the camera, he says, I've got it all. I've got two new cars for my family. And then it cuts. I've got a four bedroom house. And he's in there reading his day off. He says, I'm a member of, of the best country club in our community. And he finally looks at the camera as if revealing a secret. He says, would you like to know how? Would you like to know how I did it? And he's got this big, beaming smile. He says, I'm in debt up to my eye. <laughs> Please help me. <laughs> there are lots of people who are happy all the time, but they're dead inside. There are lots of people who are happy all the time, but they're trapped in bondage. There are lots of people who are happy, but they're numb, and they go through life without really experiencing all that God has in store. And I'm here today to tell you that God wants more for you than to just be happy. God wants for you to be more than happy. He wants you to be free. More than happy, He wants you to turn away from the things that hold you back. More than happy, He wants your heart to break for the loss of others. He wants your heart to break for the abuse that is visited upon other people. He wants your heart to break for the world that He sees in me and wants you to see it too. He wants you to experience anger and injustice. He wants you to cry out when things are not fair, when people don't do as they're supposed to. He wants you to be more than happy. He wants you to be alive. He wants you to have the life that He wants to give you. And I think most of us, in the interest of trying to be happy, shut away our hearts. Shut away the places that feel sorrow. Shut away the places that feel afraid. And shut away the places that feel angry. We went as a staff to our annual conference. It's where all of the Methodist leaders in the state of Florida get together. There's thousands of people. And there's lots of conference-y things that happen. There's meetings and uh, get-togethers and luncheons and all kinds of things. So uh, me and Elizabeth, who's our youth intern, decided we were going to go check out the young adult. And I know it's shocking, but I still qualify as a young adult. <laughs> so we, we went to this young adult dinner, and uh, we were going to get a chance to hear the conference's plan for young adult ministry. And while we were there, one of the leaders uh, who was responsible for all of that said something that, uh, well, it, it was downright offensive. It was objectifying young people. He was talking about how he was going to use young adults in a way that was really not healthy or good for them at all. And uh, as we drove back to meet uh, the rest of our group, me and Elizabeth were chatting about kind of how things went. And uh, that, that comment and that topic came up. And Elizabeth kind of said, you know what, I'm actually really angry about that. And I said, oh, well, you know, politics and all, and she said, yeah, I know, I get it, but it's not right what he said. I don't like the way he treated us. I don't like the way he views us. It makes me angry. The guy said, well, yeah, but you know, what are you going to do? I mean, if you're going to be in the church, if you're going to work in the church, then you can't really carry that anger around. You just got to let it go. And she said, is that really what you think of me? You think I'm the kind of person who just is going to carry around this bitter anger and hatred? I said, no. I'm angry about what was said, because what was said was wrong. And it was unfair, and it was unjust. And she got real confrontation and said, you need to let me be angry about this, because it's okay to be angry about this. And in the midst of that confrontation, I really had to ask myself, why, why was I so uncomfortable with her anger? And I unpacked that the rest of the night, and I came to realize that she was angry at something that I had no control over. There was nothing I could do that was going to solve that problem. I had no influence over that particular leader. I had no ability to speak into his life and show him the error of his ways. I had no ability to make his comments do less damage than what they had already done. I had no ability to stop 
people from feeling the way they feel. And what I was really made uncomfortable by was not her anger at something that she should be angry about. I was made uncomfortable by my own helplessness, by my own inability to solve this problem. I think we do this. I think we do this a lot, actually. We deny the emotions of our hearts, and we deny the emotions of other people's hearts because it renders us helpless in the face of a world that is beyond our control. We have to confront real sorrow and real fear. And I don't know about you, but in my experience, most of the time, the Spirit of God speaks to me through my heart. It's very rare that God comes down with a big, booming voice and says, get your stuff and go over there. Go do this. Go talk to this person. Go do that. Get up every day and go to this job. God rarely does those types of things. Most of the time when God speaks, He speaks directly into our hearts. And if we spend most of our time in the name of happiness, in the name of comfort, shutting away our fear, our sorrow, our anger, we're really shutting away the messages from God's Spirit that He leaves in our hearts. There's a book called Cry of the Soul by a guy named Dan Allender, and he writes in that book that our hearts, the messages we get from them are really, they're like messages from the front lines of battle. They are important messages about who we are and who we believe God is. And they are from the front lines of a very real spiritual struggle that goes on inside each and every one of us. And most of the time, rather than receiving the message for the great strategic information it is, we kill the messenger. We shove our fear down. We shove our anger down. We don't allow ourselves to feel it. We don't allow ourselves to mourn and grieve and feel the, the bitter sorrow that life brings us. We don't allow other people to feel the sorrow and the grief and the mourning from the losses they've suffered. Because it makes us uncomfortable. And instead, I ask that we will follow the example of Job. That in the midst of sorrow and loss, we will tear our cloaks and put ourselves in ashes and say, God, where are you? What are you doing with this? And reject in every chance we get to follow the example of Job's friends that would have us believe that God just wants us to be happy and comfortable. To have us believe that in order to be faithful Christians, we need to completely disregard any messages of sorrow and fear and anger. That example is one that God strikes down. It's one that God calls out for the lie that it is. Remember that God wants so much more for you than happiness. He wants you to be free from bondage. He wants you to have life of significance and purpose. He wants to give you full and abundant life. But in order to do that, we're going to have to face some pretty serious sorrow, some pretty serious fear, some pretty serious pain. It's going to put us in a place where we're totally and completely on our God. Please pray with me. Lord, we come to you as humble children, as people who are unaware of the great glory that you have poured over us, unaware of the grace that you readily give us, unaware of the ways that we have denied it, unaware of the ways that we have caused suffering and pain for others. And so, Lord, we need you to open our eyes. We need you to reveal to us the deepest corners of our hearts. We need you to help us to lay our burdens, our sorrows, and our fears at your feet. To come boldly and honestly into the dark, shameful places. And Lord, if we do that, will you, will you meet us there? Will you shine your light, the light of your holy name? Will you illuminate the darkest places of our hearts? restore back what has been taken, what has been lost? Will you return to us what we have 
wrongfully given away before we realize what we've done. Lord, pour your grace and mercy out over us. Make us the church that you would desire. Make us the kind of people that boldly give everything to you. And with everything, Lord, we come in your name. Not under our own power, not under our own strength, but in your mercy and your grace. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Our worship support team is going to pass out registration cards right now. Um, and if you're a first time guest today, and if you would like to register your information, write that on the green side and we'll get in contact with you. And if you've been with us before, please write down your name. And if any of your information has changed, write that on the right, white side. Um, if you've had um, God speak to your heart today in any way, to get more involved, to ask questions, to delve deeper into any of this, please write down.
saved in the places that are dark and deep and shameful. May you experience healing and restoration. May he give you a story to tell of miraculous, miraculous grace. And may you never be tricked into thinking you're supposed to be happy all the time. Go in peace.